On May 22, 2011, an EF-5 tornado cut a path seven miles long and up to a mile wide out of Joplin, Missouri. At the center of one of the most damaging tornadoes in U.S. history was St. John's Mercy, an institution people rely on in times like these. Kevin Miller was the mechanic on duty that evening. I, I normally eat my, take my lunch break at 6, so due to the, the weather conditions outside, I thought a little after 5, I thought, well, I'll go ahead and go up to the cafeteria, get my lunch, and come down, because during storms, we generally have to stay in the boiler room. So I went up there, and I no sooner stepped in the cafeteria, and they announced condition, or execute condition grade. Normally, it's prepare first and then execute. Well, they said that. So everybody was scurrying around, so I immediately come back down to the boiler room. I've got the TV on, I'm watching Channel 16, and they're filming the tornado. We have a few power dips, which takes out a couple air handers. No big deal, you know, we reset them. Didn't think that much about it. Well then, the boiler goes off, shuts down due to the power dip. So I'm out there trying to reset it, then everything goes black. The generators are kicking on. I step back in the office and I, just poke out the door there, look, and I see all this debris start coming through the door. I just pulled the door shut and got down. Of course, it only lasted just a few minutes. Everything was black. I opened up the door, and of course, my main concern is the boiler. It won't relight. You know, the generators are sitting there running. They actually didn't run very long because the two outside generators, the building had collapsed basically on them, which left the, the two downstairs running, but well, they just ran as long as they could, and it was just too much load, so they shut down. So I've got water and everything coming down in the boiler room, a few leaks, and I decided I'm getting out of here. <laughs> Jerry Lawrence, the facility manager, had been communicating with Kevin throughout the day. Shortly after the tornado, knowing there was damage in the area, he called to make sure everything was under control. So I called, and, and he was in panic. And he said, there's people laying in the halls bleeding, the boiler room's destroyed, and, and I said, we'll be right there. Before the rest of the team arrives, Kevin must do whatever he can to assess and stabilize the situation. So I go up into the hallway where there were some ES people and food service people. Well, I'd heard the gas main spewing right outside up from the boiler room there. And they were wanting to go back in toward that area. And I told them, I said, no, we need to get away from that. So I got everybody up around SPD and then went down to SP, or down to the laundry area, opened up the door since I had a key, started grabbing blankets, towels, whatever. And then in the meantime, after I'd got the people, got the supplies up there, I decided to, to go outside. And I knew the gas main was spewing. And there's a fireman up there, so he's walking my way. And I said, we've got a gas main spewing. Oh, we've contacted the gas company. We, there's nothing we can do. Around this time, Jerry and some of the rest of the facilities team start arriving on site, and after the gravity of the situation hits them, they begin executing their emergency management plan. And then when I finally got to the parking lot, cars were piled up like leaves. The helicopter was totally destroyed, laying on its side. You try to do what you've been taught over time, uh, so the first thing I did when I got here was go to the generator building. When I got to the generator building, it was gone. And uh, an air handler was laying right in the middle of the generator building and had destroyed it. So there was gonna be no power whatsoever. Uh, I went around over to go into the mechanical area. And when I got around there, there was a, a huge gas line, which was spewing gas. Uh, so we started trying to uh, get people to get that turned off. Well, in the meantime, we go back down into the boiler room. We sh we're starting to shut valves, kill all the breakers. We go up to the third level where our main power is, do the same thing. We go down into the basement area. Well, then Phil Werkelson shows up, and Jerry says, Phil, can you shut off the gas main? He got into the gas stream and, and tried to turn the valve, and, and, and he couldn't, so he got back out and got his breath and got back in again and, and fought it again. And I think finally on the third time, and he was really straining everything he got, he got that gas valve to shut off. And um, I suppose that's because we hadn't shut it off in years and we kind of learned from that. Uh, maybe on we ought to have a regular PM to on, 
go and shut that off and you know do what we can do to make sure those are easier to shut off in the future. A lot of people had reported that St. John's was on fire, the building was all on fire. But what it really was was the plume from the liquid oxygen tank was uh, going up about 100 foot in the air, you know, as it vaporized off. And he knew that, you know, you have oxygen, you have gas on the other side, and you can get low-lying areas, all that blend, and then someone come along with a spark and, and blow it all up. So he then went and got all that shut off, got the oxygen shut down, and so we continued to do that. We would try to think of, of one danger after the next. We as facility people should take care of, and so the next thing we decided as a team was we were gonna shut off all the water um, there had been reports from the water company that they had low water pressure in this area of town and Freeman's Hospital was low on water and, and they couldn't have all their services due to the low water pressure. We got that all shut off. Uh, one of the things that we realized real quick is the flashlights we had, that was all we had and, and they were lasting about 30 minutes and, and we did go through and, and take all the batteries we could find and put them together and, and, and use those, but going down the halls was like a maze. All the ceiling tiles were down, the ceiling track, wires hanging, and the floor was rubble that had all been piled up by the wind. At around dusk, after the building had been evacuated, the authorities took over and told everyone that there was no need to return to the building for the rest of the evening. They moved us to the Brady Building, which is a building about a block south of the main building. It had received damage also, but not nearly as bad. And so we went down there to check it, make sure everything was fine, safe, so forth. And then from there, they used that as a, kind of a command center to evacuate the patients from there over to Freeman's and other hospitals. Though the hospital had been evacuated that evening, in some ways, the biggest part of the work from a facility's perspective had just begun. Kevin Wagner and a team from the Planning, Design, and Construction Department were brought in early Monday morning to assess the situation and determine how they were going to proceed. By the time we got to the hospital and did a quick walkthrough, the magnitude of the situation had, had really struck and I knew we were gonna be here for quite some time trying to, trying to recover. So our immediate concerns were risk management. And, and risk mitigation. The first thing we had to do was make absolutely sure there was nobody left in that hospital. Um, so the search and rescue teams came in and you know it, it, it's a pretty tedious thing to do because you've got to be sure any nook, cranny, I mean they, it took a long time to get through the facility. Our team's job was to analyze what risk do we have to go take care of so the things that were coming to mind were the MRI machines. There was one in the hospital, one in the MOB. If those things don't have a constant source of power and chilled water, the cryogens charged in the magnet will quench. And if there are people in the building, you could be seriously damaged uh, by those, ma those magnets quenching. We had residual power from battery supplies, UPS machines. We weren't sure exactly the status of the city utility feeds or Empire Electric feeds coming into the building. We were concerned with the structural integrity of the building. So our immediate assessments, we started to just wanted to buzz through and look at some critical structural points to see what kind of failures we may have been dealing with. Then I think security became a huge issue because you know we had people trying to get back into the hospital, into the property. Um, and our security team was just not large enough to, to manage all that. After the first 24 hours, consisting mostly of risk mitigation, they moved into the second phase of recovery. There were still some urgent recovery needs that needed to happen at the hospital. Uh, things that were in the hospital that uh, we knew we needed to go get out. And we needed to get out immediately. Uh, there was data in our computer rooms. There was uh, some backup redundancies between the hospital and the MOB, thinking that we're not going to lose two billions at once. We lost two billions at once. We had to go in and recover that data. There were medical records that needed to be retrieved immediately. There were patients that were receiving chemotherapy treatments on an ongoing basis. Those doctors chart and know, and a lot of our electronic medical records covered a ton of stuff, but there were still some things we really needed to go get. Um, there was a patient that had a, had a prosthetic leg that was lost in the evacuation. Uh, we got the request to go get that. Um, the pathologist showed up 
and in the parking lot as we're trying to stage people and assess whether we really needed to go back in this thing as ceilings were still collapsing, glass was falling out of the building. The pathologist came out and grabbed me and said, in the tissue processors in the gross pathology lab, there are biopsies and tissue samples for people that had procedures that we have not analyzed yet. We can't repeat that procedure and we don't know if these people have cancer. Like, we probably better go get that. <laughs> so, suited up and went in and, and retrieved those samples. Also, Tuesday of managing media, dignitaries, um, federal agencies, everybody that showed up and wanted to see the hospital. Um, folks that really needed to see what we were dealing with, but it was very unsafe for us to go walk them through as we were trying to stabilize. So that fell somewhat to my responsibility. Um, as these folks were showing up, we knew we were obligated to show them something. So I got our construction crews to go into the front main door of the hospital with a uh, piece of equipment. We tore out all the doors and storefront, scraped it all out, drove our equipment into the lobby and cleaned out the whole lobby. We built a wood handrail system through there so we could get people in that front door safely and right back out. Though they had opened a temporary facility at Memorial Hall, a local community building in accordance with the citywide disaster plan, it was obvious very early on that they would need another option for a better facility to operate out of. The Missouri DMAT came into the um, convention center where we had set up and um, they told me that they had this mobile medical unit that set up that they've been doing maneuvers in. And so we got in the car and Dr. Dodson and uh, Mike and uh, Lynn and I went to Branson and the MMU was set up, we looked at it. We thought, you know what, we can make this work. So we immediately notified the Missouri DMAT that we wanted the unit brought. On Wednesday, the unit started arriving and uh, Wednesday night at uh, 1 a.m., that unit was completely set up. When Britton gave a speech, this was on Wednesday, during that speech, Lynn said, one week from the tragedy of this thing, we will open a field hospital on Sunday. And my, the feeling in the pit of my stomach, I'm like, okay, let's go. So basically ran out of that meeting up to the gay lot and started screaming faster, faster. <laughs> so. Uh, as we were trying to figure that out, the challenge was laid to us on Wednesday. So that's when my involvement really became reality that this thing had to happen. But it wasn't just the DMAT piece. It was a CT, it was an MRI, it was a surgery trailer, it was a dialysis unit, it was food services. All these components and pieces were being brought to the site by uh, Mercy Command Centers and our partnering, uh, purchasing partners, ROI. But when they arrived to the site, it was my team's responsibility to figure out how to fit it on that parking lot and power it up. Problem is, you can't get power from the transformer to all these pieces of equipment without distribution gear. And we didn't have any kind of gear on hand. It's all custom built that you would have to do to distribute that. So it became readily apparent we were gonna have to run off of generators. And also we needed potable water. We needed to be able to drain sewage away from this thing. If we did determine we would have potable water by the time we opened, we did find a water source, and our engineering team sat down and started sketching, just drawing out, okay, what does this field hospital look like? Uh, really, by Thursday, the day after, we had a plan. And as these things were coming in, we knew where we were gonna set each piece, and we knew how we were gonna power it up. Right immediately, then Sunday morning at seven o'clock, we reopened our, our hospital, and uh, we saw our first patient at 7.03. And I, I will tell you, I've never felt so proud probably in my whole career. Working in the MMU turned out to be quite different than the familiar environment of their brick and mortar hospital. Everyone's roles changed uh, from doing a lot of preventive, thinking about how we could do things better in the future, energy efficiency, those kind of things, to more take care of the immediate thing that must be taken care of the, that's at hand. Like the plumbing line broke, because the building, whatever, that they put in shifted a little bit, and so now we have raw sewage dumping on the parking lot. Those kind of things you gotta take care of immediately. They had two trailers, surgery trailers. It was 114 degrees for a couple of weeks, at least a week, out here on the parking lot. Quite often people would go into those trailers which were built for surgery and just the people in there, and they would use those restrooms. And what they went to a holding tank which had to be flushed the way it was designed. That happened five, six times a day because everybody wanted to use those. So you changed to doing those kind of tasks 
electrical problems. Everything was very, very limited. You only had so much power. Remembering that they, they did everything. They set the tents up. Men came in, contractors, and ran all the electrical, including switch gear, backup power, generation, everything. All the plumbers dug all the ditches, ran all the sewer lines, all the supply water lines. All that happened in a week. A lot of times those electrical boxes for distribution, breakers would trip. They would fail. Uh, these were going to critical items within the hospital and, and the patients. So the men would have to go immediately. It's an emergent need to go get the power back on. Do whatever you need to do to, to make that happen. We built a building around the switch gears and pumped air conditioning into them to keep them all online serving all these services. So those were the kind of things we fought. It was clear that the MMU would not be a good long-term solution, nor would it be enough to get them through the winter. So they quickly began working on a plan to get them into a hard-sided building. When we found out about the Johnson Portables, General P.K. Carlton, who's a retired U.S. Surgeon General, um, is the one who actually came here and um, I was not familiar at all with, with those things. He said, you got the tents going, that's great. And I'm sitting here writing step one tents. And he said, that's awesome. As soon as you're done with that, don't pat yourself on the back and say congratulations because you got to get out of those tents. And so, okay, what do we do next? And he kind of walked me through, you know, step two, you're in portable building. Step three, you're in a component hospital. Step four, you're in your permanent replacement. General Carlton said, you know what, let's go to California, let's look. So we did, we flew to California and we looked at the Walden Component Hospital, which there is a hospital out there that we actually went in and physically walked through. And I was surprised at how nice it was and how um, it looked like a hospital. You really couldn't tell the difference between the hospital that was normal and the hospital that was the component. You really couldn't tell. So we looked at the Johnson Portable uh, design and looked at, you know, how could we make that possibly work. To be very honest with you, I really had no idea what the Johnson Portable actually looked like until it began arriving. I mean, I saw the drawings, I saw the pictures, but to have a true concept of what it was, I didn't know. Our, our concerns when we learned of the portable buildings and as we're trying to make the plans, we're trying to fit as much service as we could into that parking lot, but also it became very apparent that this had never been done before. Um, so trying to provide patient care in a portable building, our initial concerns were, is the state and regulatory people even going to allow us to do this? I mean, we don't have the power distribution, we don't have the air changes, we don't have any of the stuff that's minimum requirements, but we did have a lot of it. So it's instantly identifying if we put these portable systems together, what do we have to provide to make sure we're providing safe patient care environment? We did quickly come to a comfort level that we would be able to provide adequate patient care in the portable buildings or we would not have moved forward. But as we went through evaluating these things, you know, the, the history of before this, if a portable building went up, it was potentially a 30 by 40 open structure that some cubicles went in and it became command centers or nutrition centers or whatever else. But, you know, trauma bays, ICU beds, that hadn't been done as far as I know, uh, to the scale and degree we did. Our other concern was we could not take the tents out of service completely to build the portable buildings. There was enough of the parking lot left over that we could build the first piece of portable buildings without having to take any of the tent structure down. So we built the ED portion of the MMU in the portable buildings on the open spot on the parking lot and connected it to the open side of the surgery trailers. So we were able to get all the way through the new piece and connect through the surgery corridor and at basically while the hospital was in operation, we were building literally where they were operating on top of them with that connector between the surgery trailers to try to enclose that and bring the portable building so we would just do half at a time and make sure when we had critical times we had to get in front of the door to the surgery trailers and we just didn't have any scheduled cases and we'd leave one open for emergency uses and working really closely with surgery staff to schedule and time all that, we were able to build our first piece of portable building connect it through the OR trailers and ramp down to the tent. Systems of connectors, corridors, ramps, and just working our way across the site were we able to accomplish changing the building out on the same footprint. It was better for us, uh, but we just 
have new challenges. Uh, when you went from the hospital and the power situation, which was short, we had a little more power, but it's just a little more. It's not, it's the same spot with hard-sided building there now. Uh, there's, it was hard to cool or it would be really hard to heat that tent in cold winter weather. So the sides, the hard building, the Johnson building, gave you that ability to heat somewhat better, but not a whole lot better. It's just a two inch thick wall, you know. Everything was a little better, but we still have all kind of challenges. Uh, as doors open, it washes all your heat out of the building. There's no vestibules on this building, uh, things like that, you know. It, uh, as the building settles, we still have plumbing issues, uh, just a whole different set of problems that we now fight. Uh, leaks, or some leaks, uh, it is temporary building, you know, so how much money do you spend on it? But leaks, uh, floor buckling up, uh, which you don't like to have any leaks because you don't want mold in a hospital. So um, it's much better for the patients, much better for clinical. It's somewhat better for us, but we're anxious to get in a, an actual building with actual services that are designed large enough to take care of all the needs and, and you don't have to pick and choose. With the hard-sided buildings completed and occupied, they can now turn their full attention to constructing a new, more permanent facility that would get them through the three years needed to design and build their new permanent hospital. Involvement with the component hospital was very early in the process. Uh, really, the, the, the tough part in the beginning was this has never been done before, obviously, and the volume and scale of how we were going to accomplish this, the concern was can we really crank that much product out of the existing availabilities of services and make this thing happen in the time frame we want to make it. Um, the challenges really were going out, looking at the factory, getting a comfort level that, that, that could be produced. Uh, the logistics of how are we going to get 240, 250 some pieces of modular buildings from California to Missouri and getting the site ready and knowing exactly what has to happen to that site prior to those buildings showing up. Uh, we asked them what typically was the construction period. The construction period is, was somewhere around a year period of time that you would have typically seen that done. We explained to the owner of the component hospital or the, the uh, manufacturing that that was not an option for us. We had to be in faster than that. Um, so before we actually had left um, the Hammond Center, the convention center where we set up our, our um, command center, we had those drawings laid out. We had everybody there. So that was done very rapidly, even before we had given approval to move forward with the contract. Um, and you got to understand there are a lot of pieces and parts that went into that. Um, the decision was made to move with that facility even before we even thought that FEMA would have any part of this. So our system made the decision that they would go ahead and, and fund moving forward with a component hospital. We would still follow all the FEMA rules and regulations, but we assumed we would end up paying for that. So we told uh, Mr. Walden that we needed to have it up and running by the first part of April. And um, I know he was quite shocked by that comment, um, but once again, all the contractors and subcontractors got in a room and talked about the process and talked about what we needed to do to move forward and, and get ourselves back to as much of a standard of care as we could possibly be in the fastest manner that we could be. Once again, our goal was to do it before May because we wanted to have it up and moving in less than a year. Many of the people at Mercy have seen their roles change significantly as they move forward with all the various construction projects. As they progress through each phase, they've compiled a number of lessons learned that they can share with other facilities who may encounter similar situations. Um, yeah, a, a lot of it is just removing barriers for decision making and trying to streamline who is actually making the decisions in your organization and trying to minimize the number of command centers and steps you have to go through to get a decision made. Uh, in a big organization such as Mercy, everybody wants to help, but 
a clear line of where the decisions have to be made to make things happen would potentially speed things up because as much as you want to practice for something like this, you can never be prepared and there's a lot of things you just make up as you go. Redundancy and how you build your hospital. You know, as we build our new hospital, we need to identify a lot of pieces that are redundant so that if we lose power or we lose a generator or we lose whatever, that we have a backup opportunity. You know, we would like to be able to work with our state and frankly, the nation um, and look for things that how could you maybe avoid if you were totally devastated such as we were Maybe the state or the, the federal government should have in its um, stockpile some ability to pull a building out and put it up as rapidly as we're putting up our component hospital. Another lessons learned in the process of the initial uh, stabilization and when you move into the recovery phase, the biggest lesson I learned is you really, as a health system or an owner or anybody, you need to rely on your trusted partners to provide the service for you. The, it was truly amazing the, the amount of folks that showed up that we knew and had great partnerships with that had exactly what we needed. And to use the local health, use the people we had established relationships with, they were incredible. Um, on the flip side to that, there are a lot of people that show up to take advantage of the situation. It's very unfortunate, but it's a fact that you have to acknowledge and be very, very careful. There's a lot of people that will show up and say, I do this all the time, I have a disaster recovery company, that I have a trailer full of exactly what you need, hire me and I'll help you. That doesn't work out so well. You've really got to take the, the uh, control and ownership of the situation. Um, I, I can't say a bad thing about anybody, but there's a lot of folks that want to come in and try to tell you what you need to do from federal government uh, agencies, from insurance companies, from all these other things, because they've experienced this before, but at the end of the day, it's your hospital. It's your decision as an owner, and you need to be sure that you're in control of those decisions. You know, I, I've told people this over and over, and I do believe very strongly that one of the things that made our, our, our evacuation so successful was that our staff actually had to physically move people in, an, in one of our disaster drills. Now they didn't move patients, but we had mocked up patients and they had to bring them down stairwells and they had to identify where they were going to take them once they got them out of the building. And um, I think that was helpful. From May 22nd until April 1st, we will have functioned, developed in three hospitals, all uniquely different, all have their own unique challenges and or opportunities. Um, and it's pretty amazing. If someone would have told me that several years ago, I'd have never believed it. And then when you think about building a new hospital in a three-year period of time, that's a pretty phenomenal thing too because that's normally three to five years to plan and get it all laid out and then move forward. We're taking what normally takes a three to five year period and putting it in about a three month period of time. Um, and it's, it's, uh, boy, it's energizing.